Well, hello, this is Jeff Gadiosi, and you're on MisplaceStraws.com, where music comes to life. And, and it's hard to come up with a proper introduction for my guest today, simply because she's done everything. She's led the way for women in rock and roll, influencing nearly every woman and most men that have come after her. She sold more than 50 million records worldwide. She's launched a successful acting career. And she's about to release a brand new record called Devil and Me on March 26th. Please welcome the one and only Susie Quattro. Welcome, Susie. Thank you, Thank you very nice to be here. So, uh, very nice to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And there's a lot to talk to you about, but let's start with this new record, uh, Devil and okay. Me. Um, written and recorded with your son, Richard. What's it like working with your son to put a record like this together? Well, I mean, we had our first outing with no control. Yep. That was our first outing together. And we got our feet wet on that because we hadn't worked together before. So brand new exercise. You know, he hadn't worked with me. I hadn't worked with him. And we started to write together and go into the studio together. So I think he had um, more of an adjustment than I did because of my background. Mm -hmm. I, I played with my dad you know, on the bongos. Then I was in a band with my sisters. Mm -hmm. Then I came to England and formed an English band and married my guitar player. So for me, it's not so strange, but I think he had to adjust, mm -hmm. which he did. He did on the last album. He got it together. It's my favorite story and he doesn't like me to tell it, but here's how it happened. So he, he, he finally said to me, maybe the fourth time in the years that he's been in bands, mm -hmm. I'd like to write with you. I'd like to write with you. And finally he went, mom, I need to write with you. Mm -hmm. um, different different expression yeah. there. So he showed me what he had and we went into the studio and he was sitting, it was, uh, don't do me wrong. He was sitting there, I was sitting here with my bass, scratch mic, we're putting down a demo. Mm -hmm. And we're playing away. And this is, this is just real coming of age. Playing away and he went, oh my God. I said, what's the matter? He said, all of a sudden I'm in the studio with Susie Quattro. <laughs> And so I looked at him and I said, and? <laughs> and he went, okay, ready? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a either, that's step up and bat, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but, but it was, he, he kept saying to me all the way through that first album, he had to adjust. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fair enough. I, I'm not Susie Quad, I'm not his mom when I'm working, I'm Susie Quad. Right. But at the end of the day, I mean, the songwriting is a very vulnerable, soul-bearing process. Was he nervous at all to open up like he needed to with you? He was, again, on the first album, we were, I mean, he's really found his feet now, I have to say that. The mm -hmm. first one, the first time out, so you're getting your feet in the water. But I, I remember we were sitting out on the patio, so it was all new, and we were writing for the first album. And he, he stopped what he was doing and he said, oh, he said, Mom, I just don't believe this buzz, this creative buzz. And I said to him, I could teach you to fly. And we both went, and it was a song. Yeah. So this is how it came in. This one now, he, he more, he more uh, got his confidence up, let's yeah. put it that way. And he had his vision. And he was pretty, pretty tough on it. He wasn't this way on the last one. The last one, whenever we had a little bit of a disagreement, he'd say, oh, this is your album. This time, he dug his heels in. And he said, I want this to have a vibe, mom. And if it doesn't, I will tell you, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be obstinate about it. And he was. But I trusted him because I know he's not doing it for him. He's doing it for me. He's always said to me through the years at different points, I know what kind of album you should be making. I know, Mom, I know. That's really good, but I know, I know. And he really seems to, God. He spent his whole life from tiny watching his mom on stage be Susie Quattro. Mm. So that soaked into him, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's in his DNA. So then finally when he's starting to work with me, he's bringing his... 36 year old generation of music to the table. Hmm. He's bringing his lifelong vision of me, how he thinks I am, hmm. how he sees me, and the energy, you know, just this, you know, all that. And I'm bringing my 
my 57 years and my lifetime worth of experience. And I keep saying it because it's true. I gave birth to him. And he's, in a way, giving rebirth to me. Mm -hmm. That's just, This is what this feels like. And I didn't even know that, you know, I keep saying he lit my fire again. I didn't know it needed to be lit. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm out there doing what I'm doing. But like I said, I think it's seeing me through his eyes. That's what I'm able to do now. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm rediscovering me. And in a, in a grown-up way, which is really nice, you know. Well, and it's funny because you mentioned sort of his influence on this record. I think it would have been real easy to listen to your past and write a Susie Quattro record. He didn't and want this, to do that. And this has some of that, but it, it goes in so many different places. The piano, the horns, the strings. You know, it was almost like you taking a leap to believe in that as well. And it really pays off. Yeah, you're, he did... Um... He did do certain nods, mm. you know, like, um, which one is it? Hey, Queenie. Yeah. I mean, that was inspired by Glycerine Queen, which was on the first album, which was a true story, true story about a, a transvestite that came into our dressing room. <laughs> and uh, and, and my, my ex gave him some glycerine to drink, which you don't do. So we <laughs> called him a Glycerine Queen. And that's been in my set since 1973. Lasted the test of time. So when Richard was working on that riff, he said, why don't we call this a Queenie and revisit this transvestite? And he's old now. So we did it with that purpose and my little nod to that song. And we even put the Wurlitzer piano from the first band, that little sound, you know. But some of the stuff just went, you know, like my heart and soul. Where did that come from? Yeah. Yeah. Love's gone bad. Where did that come from? You know, and, and, it's, and it's somehow, you must admit, it's all, I don't know how, it's all come together. It, it, it flows, you know, it, it, yeah. it starts one way and then kind of twists and turns, but comes back and it keeps it all together. Yeah, and I don't know how we managed to do that with such a diverse album. But I guess Richard kept saying to me while we were recording, if it doesn't have the right vibe, it can't go on. Mm -hmm. And he would sit there as we're putting out, maybe I'm putting a bass on it, it would be like this in there sometimes he would go no 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 or he'd go yeah and he was real yeah you know, I, I i started to trust him yeah you see he's very didn't know he was so talented i would have been nicer to him as a kid <laughs> <laughs> it's not my line that's actually a kirk douglas line about michael douglas which i always love. Kirk line. Yeah, and yeah. talking about songwriting and having to trust the people you're working with. I mean, going way back toward the beginning, you know, when you first get to England and Mickey Most hooks you up with Nikki Chin and Mike Chapman as writers and producers. I mean, you were also writing. Were you worried at the beginning that, you know, as a girl coming from Detroit, that these two guys from Australia and England, they're not going to see things the way you see them for your career? No. Um, it was Mickey, actually, who never knew how to get me on record. We did we did maybe 18 months of record. He just didn't know. He knew what I was. He saw that. You know, he said to his wife after he saw me the first time, I found it, I found it, I found it. So he knew what I was, but he couldn't record it. And so then we went off and did this big tour when I, for, I finally formed a band. And we're doing all my own songs, all original material. And um, we did the slave tour, the first slave tour with Thin Lizzy. I had the opening spot, 15 minutes. Whoa. Uh, I, get, I get a break now. <laughs> and um, by the time we got off that tour, the band had found its sound, obviously. Mm. You know, you're on like a two-month tour. You're going to find out who you are. And at that time, he signed up uh, Nikki and Mike. And so all Mickey said to me was, yes, he signed me as a singer, songwriter, musician. That's what I was signed mm. as. I'm a very prolific writer and I'm a good writer. But he said, he said, I'm not getting anywhere. Um, do you mind if they come along and hear what you've done, what you do, your life set, and maybe be able to craft you a three minute hit single by what hearing what you do. So I didn't have a problem with that. Not at all. Mm -hmm. And they, and all the stuff I was writing at that time, if you listen to the first album, you can see it's very boogie based anyway. Mm -hmm. So Mike, Mike picked that up. He picked up the way I played bass, picked up on my character. And a couple of days later, after seeing us, he had the song. 
-hmm. and it it did this we really meshed you mm -hmm. know um they wrote for me they didn't bring me a song right and they would say in that. Yeah. yeah mickey would say susie needs a single at this particular time mm -hmm. and so they would come up with that and i would write all the time i did with the majority of the albums so and that suited me but then there was sometimes where because mike always said he hated it when b-sides were crap mm -hmm. so he said we're going to put good stuff on the b-sides and it was so good <laughs> that more than once more than once they were all my own songs more than once he said oh he said okay i think maybe we should put an extra measure in here and put this little weird bit here so the djs don't flip it over <laughs> okay I'm not going to argue with it. Right. It ran its course. It ran its course. It did what it was supposed to do. And then when I started to just do everything myself, everything went bang, 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 bang. So, yeah. you know, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. We had a good relationship. I still work with Mike now. Yeah. He's a good guy, good friends, you know. And, you know, back then you're based in England and the whole glam rock period's in full effect. But in America, even though your sound combined that British glam of bands like Sweet and Slade and T. Yeah, it wasn't glam at all. I wasn't glam at all. Um, musically a little. You, the image, no. But you were more along the lines of your Detroit brethren of Alice Cooper and MC5 and the Stooges. It was rock and roll. I was rock and roll right. based. I was in glam, yeah. But I was in that era. I started but, in that era. Do, do you think, though, that starting in that era, because it wasn't huge in America at the time, no, kept you from breaking through because you were marketed as one of those bands, not Alice Cooper, or the Stooges, or the MC5? I think, um, and this is explored in the in Susie Q, the documentary, quite successfully. Um, I When I first started to tour there, I was having hits everywhere, all around the world, number ones everywhere. And I first toured there in 74 as support for Uriah Heep. And when I was started the tour there, it was the Eagles and Linda Ronstadt. And that's all you heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. So as Debbie Harry says in my documentary, mm -hmm. it was a little bit early to accept not so much the sound, bass playing female in a band. The just, a bit, yeah. just, just a little bit early. Yeah. And when I did Happy Days, I mean, everybody knew me. I did the Alice Cooper mm -hmm. tours. I, I toured there all the time. I sold quite a few albums. Mm -hmm. But then when I did Happy Days... Then they accepted a bass playing mm -hmm. female. Yeah. So I had to come through the door as Leather Tuscadero. Doesn't matter, you discovered me anyway. So and then I had <laughs> my biggest made it through. Yeah. yeah. I had my biggest tip, which was stumbling in during that time. But I don't know, Mike Chapman said the same thing. For some reason that little couple years of things that was going on here that was going all over the world just didn't marry up in the mm -hmm. States. Nobody knows why and I was part of that not that sound but I was in that era yeah, in that group you know? yeah. yeah plus being the only female bass player ever leading a rock and roll band so you know everything was in, in America was strange to you you weren't ready for it so it's good I came over here mm -hmm. when I did yeah and you know as the 70s went on and you started to see bands like the Runaways and Blondie and the Pretenders and then eventually the Go-Go's have success did it occur to you at the time how much of an influence you were on each of those bands? Well, <laughs> I'm always honest. <laughs> I I had no idea what I was doing was going to have such a an impact. Mm -hmm. All I was doing was, and I'm still like it now at 70, I won't compromise who I am. I won't do it so all i was doing was sticking to me sticking to me that i was taking a chance maybe it wouldn't be successful but i knew that as i was coming up in the ranks and you know coming to england and looking around and mm -hmm. i knew i was a square pig in a round hole always since i was a kid mm -hmm. and i had no other female to hang on to that was doing what i do it didn't exist so so because i didn't fit anywhere i just had to find my own niche if you like and I stuck to it. And it didn't occur to me till I watched Susie Q with an audience the first time in the London premiere. And I snuck in and stood up because I was going up for the question and answer at the end. So nobody saw me. They were all watching from and I kind of snuck in and was over on the side. I wanted to see the film with an audience to feel their reaction, to feel where the laughs came, where the ooh came, or the booze, you know, all that. So I was watching it. 
and it, and I realized a lot. It's like a penny dropped. First time ever. And I called my friend Sharif from the Runaways the next day. I said, I need to tell you something. She said, what? I said, well, I just realized something. That me doing what I did gave permission to women all over the world to be different. And she said, she said to me, and you just got that? <laughs> no, I felt like an idiot. I said, yes, I did. She thought, oh, and you just got that, did you? And you're quite right, you just got that. Yeah, because I didn't think about it. This is right. the thing. It wasn't manufactured. It wasn't like I'm going to show it. It, it just was me. Yeah. But now I'm humbled by it. Mm -hmm. Now when I realize, I mean, when Cherie gave me my award at the Shivox Award last January, mm -hmm. not this one, mm -hmm. she was giving a speech and she started to cry. I just went, I did a Zoom with Kathy Valentine and Cherie for the documentary. Mm -hmm. Kathy starts to cry. <laughs> so, I mean... I must have had such an imp. See, I'm, I'm humbled by it. Mm -hmm. Well, well, thank goodness. Definitely. Thank goodness. Definitely. Thank goodness that door was kicked down. Someone thank had goodness. to do it. You know, and you, I, you, I kicked you, it down. But I, I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and one thing, too, I think with your career, maybe it's because you were based more in England than, you know, a group like the Runaways or even Heart at the very beginning here in the U.S., their images became so hypersexualized that that's what they were sold as. You seem to kind of be able to fight against that and control your image. Totally. Was it you fighting or was it just things were different in England than they were here? I just wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Done. I did so many TV shows that I wouldn't even wear makeup. <laughs> And I, w I was determined that they would hear my music and not look at me as a sexual object. Then, of course, I became a pinup, which is a joke. But that wasn't <laughs> my doing. That wasn't my doing. Right. I mean, um, when Cam the Can was ready to come out and Mickey Mouse said it's going to be a number one, and he was right. He just, you know, had great ears mm -hmm. he had. And uh, he said, now it's image time, Susie, you know. I said, leather? He said, no, it's old-fashioned. Leather, no. We went back and forth. I won. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he stood, stood there for a minute. He said, okay, you can wear leather, because I was going to anyway. <laughs> and um, and he said, uh, he went for a minute, and then he went, how about a jumpsuit? And I went, great. And the truth is, I jump around a lot on stage. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't give a quiet performance. No. And my first thought was, great idea. I can wear the, the, the material I want to wear, and it will all stay in place. So no idea it was going to be sexy. How dumb am I? How dumb am I? So honestly, then I got the, the photos back from the session. I remember <laughs> he told it to me and I went, oh, <laughs> oh, oh dear. <laughs> it make, how can anybody be that dumb? But it shows you that I'm not a contrived. Right. right. You know, You're uh, doing what felt natural to you. <laughs> I literally did. I went. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, dear. You gotta laugh at it. anyway. So if I had if I had gone out there and with with trying to be sexualized, it wouldn't have worked. I didn't look like I was trying to be sexy. Nobody ever says that. No. Not at all. So um I mean you'd get like Cherie, she was in her underwear, you know, so <laughs> she she couldn't be agreeing about that one, you know. <laughs> And then you know, later on, you got into acting, and you mentioned the, the iconic Leather Tuscadero on Happy Days, but you did a lot of theater and television, you know, in England as well as here. What was it about the acting that drew you in as a musician? I always, when I started off, I knew I was going to be in the business from tiny. Yeah. I just knew it. I had the ability, even in the family shows at a very young age, to hold the audience, and I knew this. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not ego driven. That's just doing your little song and watching everybody watching you. And you realize they are. And, you know, it goes into your little brain. I can do this. So I always I can do that. I never wanted to be boxed into a corner. I wanted to always do whatever this profession allowed me to do. I always knew I could act. Always knew I could do that. I love musicals. Always wanted to do that. Always wanted to write. I've done that. Always wanted to do radio. I've done that. Mm -hmm. I've had my own TV show. Um, but 
the air that I breathe, I guess, is is rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. And everything is a little extension of that. Yeah. But it's all for me, as an artiste, which I am, it's all for me from the same instinct. Mm. If I'm acting a part, I'm in the part. Right. I become it, you know? It's the same thing. If I'm writing a song, I'm in the song. So whatever I do on stage is the same thing I do whatever I take on. I go in it 500%. Mm. And you often come up as sort of the, the poster woman for the lack of female representation in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Joan Jett, who admittedly got her early persona directly from you, is in. Uh, the Go-Go's are nominated this year. Hopefully they'll get in. Does it ever bother you that the Hall hasn't even put you on the ballot after the career you've had? Um, I don't know if I was on it this year or not. I think my name might have been brought up. Um, I, I don't understand it. I've said it a million mm. times. I'm actually getting past the point where I give a shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's almost prestigious not to be in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, is, it is stupid. I just say it's just... Just plain stupid. Doesn't make any sense. If I could make sense of it, I would, but I can't. So best just to let it go. Maybe they'll correct it. You know. Well, I, I think we're starting to see some of those bands that you were grouped in with, like T Rex and like Roxy Music, get in. So hopefully, you know, with Joan and the Go Go's, and then those British bands starting, they'll realize yeah, yeah. the tie that brings all of that together. Is well, you. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you really should be honoring the first if, if there are any kind of a if there. Yeah if they're worth their salt. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't really make any sense. And you know, when you look at women in rock today, um, there's a, a lot that lead, especially like the European melodic rock bands. There's a lot of great female singers. And in the U.S., you have you know, people like Lizzie Hale and Taylor Momsen. Yeah. Is there anyone that stands out to you that you listen to? And, and do you think that the business has changed at all so it's not quite as rocky a path for a woman in rock today? Um, God, I don't know if it's not as rocky. I'd have to start off again and find out. It, it's not so unusual mm -hmm. to see girl musicians. Now I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, there's still not that many, though. Mm. You know, I always mm. say it. It's not, it's not an easy job. I mean, geez. 57 years of lugging that bass around that weighs more than me. <laughs> you know, so I don't know if it's gotten any easier. I don't know. It's like I said, it's not so unusual anymore, but it's not an easy job. I never say this is an easy mm -hmm. job. You have to be, you have to be really dedicated, mm -hmm. really dedicated. And you definitely have been over the course of your career. Um, and including now, again, the new record is called Devil and Me. It's out March 26. Um, it, it really I don't want to say it surprised me when I listened to it because being a fan, I've liked pretty much everything you put out, but I think I use the term surprise in that the, the breadth of it is, as we spoke earlier, the different styles, the modernness of the sound. Um, I think it's a great record. Uh, any ideas when the world clears up, if you'll be able to hit the road and promote it at all? Well, um, I got gigs in the diary from May, and who knows? Yeah. All the stuff that was postponed from last year. So, fingers crossed, I haven't got the answer to that. Luckily, I've remained creative, so it's kept me sane. Yeah. But, I mean, I, the gigs are what I do. Yeah. You know, if you don't give me a tour booklet and a rolling bag, I don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've been spending some time here with just the legendary Susie Quattro. Again, the record is Devil and Me, out March 26. Um, a couple of times we've mentioned the documentary, Susie Q. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's on Amazon Prime. It's on Apple TV. Take the time to watch it. Uh, you'll learn something, that's for sure. Susie, it's been an absolute honor spending some time with you and getting Thank to know you. you a little bit on here. Look forward to seeing you on the road and just best of luck with this record. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.